wash me, O Lord, and I shall be clean. Give me life according to your word. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, God's word before us this morning are the words of our Old Testament lesson from the book of 2 Kings. Among the people of Jesus' time, they had their favorites of among God's teachers from the Old Testament. And at least in my way of thinking, their favorites to me don't make much sense. Maybe it's because I'm not a Jew. Maybe it's because I wasn't a part of their culture. My thought in their favorite prophets and teachers, my thought would be they would choose men, a man like Moses, the man who wrote the first five books of, the, of, of Scripture, the man through whom God gave his commandments. And there were many Jews, they talked him about him, they quoted him, but he wasn't their favorite. The next one that would come to my mind would be King David. King David, who wrote and penned many of the Psalms, many of the Psalms that are near and dear to our hearts, like Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. But he wasn't on the list either. Another one that just makes perfect sense to me would be the prophet Isaiah, the, the prophet of the Lord's promise, the one who spelled out the most clearly in Scripture those prophecies of the Savior about how he would be born, how he would live, his ministry, his sufferings, and his death. But that wasn't high on the list for, for those people either. Rather, they chose two men who never wrote a book of the Old Testament. Men who, who never had penned a, a, a book of Scripture like the other prophets. Two men by the name of the prophet Elijah and the prophet Elisha. These, don't get me wrong, these were men who spoke God's word powerfully. And Elijah, he spoke God's word powerfully against, uh, uh, against the evil kings that had come up in the history of Israel, preached out boldly and clearly against the false prophets of other gods, often faced persecution, beatings, and even faced losing their own lives. You might remember Elijah uh, was the one who met the prophets of Baal. They had that contest, and the fire rained down upon the Lord's altar. You might remember that Elijah was the one who was taken up into heaven by a whirlwind. <coughs> His protege, Elisha was another one of the favorites of God's prophets, another one who spoke powerfully out against sin, spoke boldly and clearly what God, what God's will was. And he was one who was known as the one prophet who performed the most miracles. And we get to hear about him today. We get to hear about one of his miracles, a miracle that was performed with a, for a general, on a general, a Syrian general, by the name of Naaman. And as we look at this today, I want you to get this picture. And this picture and this idea is that God loves the unlikable. We see that in the picture of Naaman. Naaman was, not, was a, a general, a commander of the Syrian army. God had given him many victories. He was highly respected. He was highly powerful. But he wasn't one of, his, again, one of Israel's favorite people. He was a general of the enemy army. He was a general of their oppressors. He had come in with his armies and actually had plundered the land of Israel, plundered it so much so that yet they took slaves. And he, in particular, had taken a slave girl from the land of Israel, a young girl had taken her from the arms of her family. This general had leprosy. And we've heard about that disease of leprosy before. It came in various stages. The most devastating 
um, segment or stage of that disease was the last one where body parts, the skin would become affected, the body parts would become so decayed and rotten that fingers would fall off, noses, the ears, and so forth. It was a deadly disease, and if left unchecked, it would, ki it would kill. And you know what? There was no known cause for it. It could start out in the early stages as to be something that's just something like psoriasis today, but it would affect the skin to where it would get hard and calloused. It would get hard to move your, your fingers and even your arms and, and legs, and it would be something that could be very painful. The type of leprosy that Naaman had was one that still allowed him to serve in the army, but it was still an inconvenience. While he's at home, he's talking about his illness, and this little servant girl, this little servant girl hears the complaints and the desires of her master about his disease, and she speaks up. And she says, Oh, that my master would see the prophet in Israel. He would heal him of, your disease, of his disease. Little girl, in the Hebrew language, not much younger than the young gals we got sitting in church this morning. She's ripped away from her family, probably doesn't know if they're alive or where they are, or if she does, that makes it even worse. This master who had taken away from her family, she wouldn't have had to say anything at all. This was, while he was her master, was an enemy, could have done nothing at all, said nothing at all to help him. But yet she says, you know what? There's a prophet in Israel that can, that can heal me. Out of the mouths of babes. You ever think to yourself when it comes to telling others about the Lord, telling others about Jesus? And I shouldn't even ask, have you ever? Because I know you have. I think the same things myself. Well, I don't know what to say. You know, and I want to say the wrong thing, so I'm not going to say anything at all. And usually the reason that we give like that is, well, isn't that what we got our pastor for? You know, I got to preach some kind of sermon. I got to teach some kind of beautiful, embellished story. And I'm afraid that if I say one wrong word, well, I'm going to make a mistake, so I'm not going to say anything at all. This girl, this little girl, didn't think about these things. Did she preach a sermon? Did she tell a Bible story? Did she speak some well planned out speech? No. <coughs> she just said, Oh, if my master, oh, if my master would visit the prophet in Israel, he would be cleansed of his leprosy. That was it. Not really hard, is it? She just stated a fact. And then what happened with her master? The wheels started turning. He went and talked to his king, the king of Aram, who said, and he said to him, there's some prophet down in Samaria, in Israel, who can heal me of my leprosy. So the king says, great idea. You know what? So he wrote a letter, sent it to the king of Israel. The story gets a little bit more interesting. The king of Israel gets this letter from the king saying, you know what, I'm sending down my general and, and uh, I'm sending him with all of this, this money. He has leprosy. I'm sending it down so you can heal him. What's the reaction of the king. The leader of God's people, who's not only supposed to be their defender in battle, who's not only supposed to be the one who leads them and governs them wisely, he's to be their spiritual example. He's to be their spiritual leader. And he freaks out. The king of Syria is trying to pick a fight with me. Am I God? Can I heal? Can I kill and, and give life back again? He's talking like a moron, an idiot. And then the prophet hears what the king, <coughs> the message that the king had gotten and what he said, and he said, send this man on down. Then you will know that there's a prophet in Israel. 
Can you relate to the king? And this king was probably King Jehoram. He was the son of evil King Ahab. Wasn't much better. He didn't follow God, didn't worship idols. Well, don't, don't let me correct myself. He did follow God, but he thought he could split his allegiance between God and idols. And he spent most of his time with idols. But can you relate to the king and what he said? The king out of all people should have known where to send this man. He should have known and said, you know what? No problem. We got a prophet here that has performed more miracles than any prophet we've ever had in our history. I know right where to send you. I know what your need is. I know where your need can be met through the powerful hand of God. Here you go. But didn't think that way. You ever find yourself in a time of crisis? You panic? And the last thing you think about our God and his promises and his promises of deliverance? Don't know about you, but I've been in those shoes too. So Naaman goes down, meets, goes to the prophet Elisha's house. Now, you know what, Naaman's a pretty influential guy, and when he gets there, this is what Elisha does. He sends a servant out, doesn't say hi, doesn't introduce himself, and he says, go, go to the Jordan River, dip yourself in it seven times and you'll be cleansed. Naaman's hot. Are you kidding me? I come all of this way down here, and first of all, the prophet can't, can't even come out and speak with me. And he tells me that I'm supposed to go down to this creek, this little <coughs> muddy, dry water. <coughs> I'll be lucky if I can find a mud puddle, and if I can't find some place to dip myself in, it's messy. Aren't the rivers of my own country, which they were crystal clear, wouldn't that, can't I go and wash in them? I mean, look at yourself. Would you rather go to a stock pond and dip yourself in the water, or go out to the Platte Ridge by the clear Missouri and, and, and dip yourself in there? I can understand what Naaman has said. And he goes, eh, I'm not doing this. You know, he said, I expected this. The prophet would come out, probably have some wand in his hand and, 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 and move it all over me and do this, and I would be cleansed. Enough of this garbage, I'm going home. And then his servants say to him, and they're risking something here, because, you know, servants didn't hold a whole lot of weight back in those days. You know, you just shut up and did what your master told you. And they said, Master, think about this for a minute. <coughs> if he told you to do some great task, some monumental effort, wouldn't you have done it? How much more easier is this just to go wash yourself and be cleansed? Can you put yourself in to Naaman's shoes? He hears God's promise from the prophet, go dip yourself in the waters of the Jordan and you will be cleansed. And you think there's got to be something I can do? This, this is just too simple. This is too dumb. You ever think to yourself that, that all of these gospel promises we hear about salvation by faith alone in Christ Jesus, oh, that's just too simple, that's just too foolish. There's got to be something that I can do to save myself. God's got to look at me, I'm such, a wonderful, I'm such a wonderful person, or if I'm not such a wonderful person, I still don't try to hurt anybody. There's got to be something that I do that he credits to me. It's, it, it's, just, it's just common sense. That's the sinful nature in each and every one of us that thinks, I don't need a Savior. I don't need God's promises. There is something that I can do to live on my own, to live happily in this life and get to the life hereafter. That's not how it works. What did Naaman do? Well, he did. He went to the Jordan, followed the command 
of the prophet, followed God's word, dipped himself in those muddy waters seven times, and he came out healed of his disease. We're told that he had the skin of a young boy immediately. What a blessing. What a blessing that was. And all of this was done for a man who was an enemy of God's people. What does he do after that? Sees that he's cleansed, he goes back to the prophet, tries to give him gifts. Now this was something that Elijah, this was the reason Elijah didn't go out to him in the first place. He didn't go out there, he didn't take the gifts that were offered to him, and I'm talking, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars in today's, today's value. First, he didn't want Naaman to think that God's blessings could be purchased. Grace that God gives freely, not because of what we do or what we can give, but because of his merciful love. God loves the unlikable. And believe it or not, you and I are unlikable. There have been times where, where, where you've heard me say in everyday conversation or when we're talking in personal conversation, you know, talk about how, and I love it, how, how I, and I love West River. Now I often say how West River people are good people. You know what I mean? But you know what? We're not good people. We're sinners. We're the unlikable. We are sinners who are hopelessly, helplessly lost and condemned, and we need a Savior. But you know what? We've got a wonderful Savior. You know, I find it no coincidence that the same river that God had, had named and go to dip himself into and be cleansed was the same river that Jesus went into and was baptized, binding us to his baptism, receiving the forgiveness that we need, giving us the holiness of his that we need. Jesus, who came into this world loving the unlovable, loving the unlikable. That's what I see in this true historical account of Elisha healing the servant Naaman. And what a blessing that is. A blessing for us to hear when we hear our Savior boldly proclaim, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. When we hear the Apostle Paul boldly proclaim, God wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. God loves the unlikable. And you know what? We're going to get to see that very clearly here just a few weeks as we just stand at the door of the season of Lent, as we get that opportunity once more again to see our Savior and hear once again all of those things that he suffered, that he endured, not because we're such lovable people, but because he is a wonderful and lovable, a perfect Savior, exactly the Savior that we need. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We will confess our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. You can find those words on page 41 in the front of the hymnal. <laughs>